It is good to be here this morning. God has given us a great, beautiful Lord's Day morning to come together and give praise and join our hearts together and look into His Word, the life word, the life book that God gave us called the Bible. And uh, certainly, uh, certainly, uh, if you're visiting, and we do have visitors, I, I see a number of visitors this morning, uh, the life show that we've had back here is, is free. Um, I have the screen that you should be seeing up there, but it's possible that I may see the screen and you do not see the screen. And, uh, you know, when it's an intermittent situation, we love our electronics, but when it's an intermittent situation, it's a little more challenging uh, to kind of find out what's going on. Um, because it works sometimes great, and sometimes it acts up a little bit like sentimental as it is this morning. But we are blessed to be together. It's good to be with people who love God, love one another, growing their love for one another, trying to share the love of Jesus with others, and we're certainly glad you're here. We are in our seventh lesson of a series that I started some time ago on journey into a passion-filled life. And these are studies from the life of David. We've been looking at that Old Testament character David because David was, God's own word says that David was a man after his own heart. And so we have been in pursuit of a God-shaped heart. And that's where you know, we find ourselves. Now I'm going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9 primarily, but I'm going to make one stop in reading in a few moments in 2 Samuel chapter 4. One of the things that has stood out and been very evident in our study of David is that he made his share of mistakes. We've seen that already. We're going to see that in the coming weeks, God willing. He sinned privately and certainly publicly. But David had something in his heart. Something in his heart that, that he wanted to line up so very closely with the heart of God. And, and, and he truly was a man in pursuit of a God-shaped heart. And thus the compassion of God and the grace of God. I think I may look back there a couple times just to see how we're doing. Uh, thus the compassion and grace of God certainly brought this man of God back to God when he got off the drift and drifted away from God's path time and again. I've entitled this lesson, If It Were Not For Grace. If it were not for grace, David would not be known as a man after God's own heart. And if it were not for grace, where would we be? We must not overlook in our study of David that he understood the life-transforming power. God's power. The transforming power. You see, God's Word is not just there for our information. It's there for our transformation. It is for us to line up with the attitude of Christ and the character of Christ and, and the love of Christ and the compassion of Christ and yes, even the grace of Christ. We must learn how to forgive as He for, has forgiven us. And so we must not overlook in this study the life-transforming power of grace. David had a passionate heart for God because he had been a recipient of God's passion, God's love, and God's grace. That kind of understanding drove David to walk closely with his Lord. We are to walk, the Christian life, we are to walk with the Lord. Christian life is a walk. It is a relationship with Jesus, and it is a walk. And the Bible says in 1 John 1 and verse 7, that if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus, uh, that precious, sinless blood of Jesus, cleanses us and enables us to walk so closely to the Lord. David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 2, Blessed are those who keep the statues and seek God with all their heart. And then in Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, I have hidden your word, God, in my heart, and here's the purpose, so that I might not sin against you. What was important in David's life was to be that lover of God that pleased God with his actions and his words. And as a result, he wanted to show his compa the compassion of God and the grace of God to those around him. He knew that God can pick us up when we fall, and He knew that we would fall at times. He fell a number of times, but He knew God could pick Him up 
as he looked back to God. He knew God's forgiveness. He learned what it was like to not only to be forgiven of God, but to learn how to forgive himself. He understood what it is so that God can pick us up and comfort us when we were sad. Do you realize that the passion that you have for anything will generally determine what you go after and the how you go after it? It will determine your direction in life, your passion. For example, you'll never be a better person than you have the passion or the desire to be. I mean, if you choose to get married, you'll never be a better husband or a better wife than you have the passion to be. If you become a parent, you'll never be a better parent than the passion or desire that you have to be. And the same is true for us as Christians. You see, we'll never be a better Christian than we have the desire or the passion to be. And when a heart is filled with passion from being in God's Word, from spending time with one another in fellowship and in prayer with God, then we will begin to move naturally into the kind of action that God's godly kind of passion would produce in us, and that will flow into our relationships. So, when we open our Bibles, the second scene of chapter 9, we find David had been doing a wonderful job as a king over all of Israel at this point. But before we get to chapter 9, I want to do a little bit of background history to bring us up to where we are here in our study today. So travel back with me to that time when, when Saul was king, the first king of Israel. Israel wanted a king. God finally said, okay, you can have a king. And he chose Saul. And uh, that time when David goes down to that battlefield in the Valley of Elah and brings that care package to his brothers who was in the army of, of Israel under Saul. And that Goliath, that giant of a problem, comes out and, and David takes on that giant with faith in God. And almost overnight, because of that success on the battlefield, David becomes a very well, becomes uh, Saul's military leader, and he becomes so successful as a military leader in the army of Israel, the army of God, that Saul becomes jealous, and jealousy is an evil thing. And then an evil spirit attacked itself to the heart of Saul, and Saul multiple times. We've already seen some of those, certainly along our study tries to kill David. David has to leave Jerusalem and in time even the land of Israel. It's a very sad situation. And Saul finally admits that David is going to be king. But during this time of Saul's pursuit, David doesn't just have difficult days. He has some difficult years. And he is not going to try to harm Saul because he's functioning as king and he's going to let God handle Saul and so he's not going to seek personal revenge against Saul. And he's going to let God handle it. And that's a godly thing to do. And we read about how that should be the case in our lives today. And in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12, for example, speaks of that. It is mine to avenge, is what God says. And here we find that finally in that previous, up to this point of 2 Samuel 9, Saul finally admits that David is going to be king. He knows that. And he asked David to, to not kill all his family members. Now there's a reason for that. The other kings that were customary at the time, usually when they became king, the new king, to protect their dynasty. They would often, I'm talking about the worldly kings of the earth, they would often kill all of the previous family members so there would be an assurance of their dynasty. Saul doesn't know what David would do, but he asked David not to do that. And of course, David would not have done that. But David promised him that he won't do that. So one day before David is ever officially made king, Saul is talking to David. And listen to what he says uh, in 1 Samuel 24. And then we'll go to, to, to uh, 
2 Samuel chapter 4. In 2 Samuel 24, verse 20, Scripture says, I know, this is, this is Saul, I know that you will surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. And then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold, you know, basically where they'd been hiding out. Now long after David had this conversation, Saul dies, as well as his son Jonathan, on the battlefield. That's, the, that's what happens. You can read about that at the end of 1 Samuel, in that very last chapter of 1 Samuel. But apparently Saul's family members do not know about this oath that David gave to Saul, and, and even a, a promise, even with Jonathan, that, that he would show kindness to, um, to Jonathan's family, Saul's son. That's 1 Samuel chapter 20. Saul and Jonathan dies at the hand of the Philistines, that, that, that army that always gave the army of Israel trouble, the, 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 the worldly Philistines. And now at the end of 1 Samuel, David becomes the king, the official king. And 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us that Saul's other son, I know it's a lot of history, but hang in there, it's worth it. Saul's other son, by the name of Ishbosheth, gave David a lot of problems and, 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 and really wanted to be king. And he was trying to be king and he, he warred with David for some time. But Ishbosheth, we learn in 2 Samuel chapter 4, that David not only is now king, but his military leader, Ishbosheth's military leader, dies and Ishbosheth loses courage. David becomes king. And this is the context where we learn, 2 Samuel 4, the first time in Scripture, we learn about a man, uh, well, in 2 Samuel 4, a boy, by the name of Mish... Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Mephosheth. Okay? Uh, Mephosheth. And this is what we learn in 2 Samuel 4. He was a five-year-old son of Jonathan. And he has a caretaker. And, and, and the, the scripture, some Bible translations say nurse. Someone that was trustworthy to take care of Jonathan's son while he was on the battlefield. And this nurse is taking care of this little boy, it's five years old. And she hears that Saul and Jonathan has been killed. And, 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 and she panics. There's fear that comes over her body and, and, and she thinks, listen, Saul has tried to kill David for several years. So she would especially think that David might go after his family. And so she fears for the life of this little boy. And she picks up this little boy and she runs, trying to, trying to get away, trying to get farther away and put space between them and David. And she accidentally drops the little boy. These are the words in 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell <coughs> and became crippled. His name is Mephibosheth. So he becomes crippled by the way of an accident. And he will be crippled for the rest of his life. Now we are ready, finally, for 2 Samuel chapter 9. But we should understand that there has been a lot of time that has passed. And Mephibosheth is not a little boy any longer. There's one day that David is reflecting, thinking about his good friend Jonathan. And one day as David is thinking about his, uh, his good friend, and they were very good friends, 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1 tells us, 
But David, David asked a question. Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And his representatives began to look around and, and, and they started asking questions and they learned about a man by the name of Ziba who was a longtime friend of Saul. And this longtime servant of Saul is brought before David and David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul? And Ziba tells David, there is a son of Jonathan living in the land of Lodamar. In the original language, and your Bible might have a footnote, the land of Lodamar means land of desolation. There is a reason that Mephibosheth is living in the land of desolation. He does not want David to know where he is. He has got as far away from, from where David could find him that is possible. And so it seems that he's hiding. And knowing what he might think and that's going through his mind, we can understand why he might be hiding. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 2. Scripture says, and I'm going to read down through verse 13, because this is our text. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David. And the king said, Are you Ziba, your servant? He replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. See, he didn't know that there was a son of Jonathan. Uh, he didn't know that he was crippled. And he didn't know how he was crippled. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is in the house of Nacar, son of Amiel, in Lodebar. So the king had him brought from Lodebar, from the house of Nacar, son of Abel. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid. David said to him, For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crop so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate, always ate at the king's table. And he was crippled in both feet. Try to put yourself in Mephibosheth's position. I suspect that he has to be a little prejudiced. I would think that his attitude would be a little biased when he's living in the land of Lodabar. He even may think that if David had not become king, my grandfather would still be king. Or maybe my father would be king. He might even think that if it wasn't for David, I wouldn't be crippled. But I am sure of this. He is afraid of David while living in the land of Lodibar. David is likely on his most wanted never to see less. He does not want to hear about David. He don't want to hear David's name mentioned. He doesn't know about the oath David made with his grandfather and doesn't know about the oath that David gave to his good friend Jonathan, his father. 
And he liked to live with the thought that if David hears where I am, I will, he will send men and take me away and have me killed. And I suspect his worst fears come knocking on the door one day. This is the king. King David wants to see you. And we're going to take you to him. And they take him to David and and, and you can, you can, it's hard to imagine, but in one sense it's not so hard to imagine the panic pouring out of these verses of Scripture as they bring Mephibosheth before David. And he comes before David and he falls to the ground and he shows him honor, but inside I, I, I just suspect he's quaking with fear. He would never have dreamed to hear these words from the lips of David. Don't be afraid. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. Mephibosheth was likely expected to hear bad news, but if you've ever expected to hear bad news and you heard good news, what a, what a wonderful, emotional, wonderful roller coaster that is. David continued in verse 7, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. And you will always eat at my table. It's hard to imagine. Saul was king. He had a lot of land. I'm going to restore to you all the land that your grandfather had. And he's going to have Ziba and, and his household be servants of the land and farm the land and, and provide for you. And you're going to always eat at my table. That's, that's a wow. Were it not for grace, Mephibosheth would have no hope. And he knows it. He does not understand why David would give him grace. But David is not only gracious and compassionate, but his actions overflow with God's kind of love and mercy. Mephibosheth stays loyal to David throughout the many challenges that David's still going to encounter in his life. We can make some applications today into the reality that if it were not for grace. In the book I wrote on David, David's life, I researched verses that deals with the extreme, I mean extreme loyalty of Mephibosheth to David. There comes a point where in David's struggles, there comes a point where there are lies told and David believes those lies about Mephibosheth but that, and, and those lies indicate that Mephibosheth was no longer being loyal to David but they were lies. And I'm not going to take time to tell that part of the story but I bring that up because I do in the book but I bring that up because you might want to definitely look at that in the scripture because it's powerful. Mephibosheth stays loyal to David in extremely difficult circumstances. But the application that we can make today is around grace. And may our thankfulness to God's grace transform our entire behavior and cause us to value what God values. Mephibosheth was so thankful for David's gracious actions and he demonstrated that appreciation for all to see, as, as you could read out in the Bible that story. And David's values and David's commitments become Mephibosheth's values. And David values what God values. And, and, and Mephibosheth sees the loyalty uh, of the oath that, that David made with his grandfather and his father and and that has an effect on his life as well. God values keeping commitments. God values integrity. And God values justice. And God values forgiveness. And Satan wars against all those values. He's always watering down God's values. He's trying to water down and twist the truth of God. And we, like Mephibosheth, must make a choice in what we value. Our choice is to either water down God's values or, or go for what God says is worth it eternally, no matter the personal cost. And the choices of the Christian life are determined by the values we have learned 
in God's life book. David was a man of integrity and he valued what God values. And Mephibosheth saw all that and that had an effect on what he valued. It had an effect on his relationship with God. And value governs our underlying thoughts and our attitudes. And certainly as those thoughts and those attitudes come together, they affect our actions. And there is a sense in which everyone has values. It's just that we put different price tags on our values. One person will get a job and he will like to get a job. Another person will tell the truth even if it means losing the job. One person will never take illegal drugs at any price while another person would steal to take them. Everyone has values. Just different values. We get a glimpse of the nature of God in David's treatment with Mephibosheth. Even in Mephibosheth's own words, by admission, he doesn't understand such grace. What is it that your servant that you should show notice to me? I'm like a dead dog. But David showed him grace. And that's what God does for us. And we need it. If it were not for grace, we would have no chance to be with God in heaven. Ephesians 2.8 It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. It's not that we can boast. God's done it. It's a gift. But we still need to have faith and be obedient to His Word. Our sins and rebellions to God did not change our worth to God. The Bible says, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. And because of sin, we have been stomped on. I was thinking... We, we may know some people better than others in here. We may not know anything about anyone else that may be here today. But because of sin, we have been stomped on. And we have been crushed. And we have been bruised. But our work was not affected because God assigned our value when He created us. The costliest gift was given in order to save undeserving sinners. And God assigned our value. That's where our worth is. We all realize that you can take a hundred dollar bill and you can crumple it up. And you can tear it. And you can tape it back together. And it's still worth a hundred dollars. Because it doesn't matter what had happened to it, it had to do with who assigned its value. God has assigned value to us. And we were valuable to God in our pre Christian state, and only that we needed the cleansing blood of Christ applied to us. And we get that blood applied to us when we believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of our sin, turn away from thinking our way is right, and go with what God says which is right, and, and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, the cleansing of our sins, coming up out of that water, a new creature. Yes, one who will still need the grace of God, one who will still need help to live out the Christian life, but God provides that for us through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 says, But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgressions or sins, and it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What response should our be? What response should we have to receiving grace and what God has done for us? 
We should trust and obey. That's what we should do. Trust what God says. And our faith in what God says moves us, that's obedient faith, moves us to obey the Lord Jesus. Our response should be the same with that in a sense as Mephibosheth's response to David. Faithfulness. Loyalty. To the King of Kings, no matter what. Our response should be one of appreciation for the gift of grace. And if we're really thankful for what God has done for us, and for the promises that He has given us in the future, let us be in pursuit of a God-shaped heart. If we can help you this morning in a public way, we pray that you'll come as we stand and sing this invitation song. If you have questions privately, just let us know. Thank you.